You ever sit down to watch a new anime and at some point you just have this sort of existential out-of-body experience? All of a sudden it's like you experience a three-dimensional representation of four-dimensional space and now you see multiple futures simultaneously because the show in question is so by-the-book bland and generic that you're calling stuff in the show well before it happens because you've seen this exact same thing before more times than you can count? Yeah, that's what you get in the very first episode of Rising of the Shield Hero. Pop a squat and buckle up because old Slappy's got some hot takes on a brand new anime that set to release January of 2019. I was at AWA a few weeks back and Crunchyroll was there supporting the cause, selling merch, and putting on a bunch of their own panels. Sadly, nothing on High Guardian Spice made it to the con floor, probably for the better, but what I had my eye on was the world premiere panel, where they debut some new anime coming down the pipe before it ever hits the airwaves in Japan or stateside. I was hoping to do another triple play on new shows, but they just had one anime up for viewing this year. Bummer. On the plus side though, it was a double episode, 40 minutes long, so I got pretty well acquainted with the show. The show begins with a completely out of context flash forward sequence, which is jarring, potentially spoils the show, and is in general just a bad way to start any show. Not to mention they all look just about the same, someone struggling while injured or close to dying against some amorphous shadowy threat, with someone else looking on wistfully while wearing some sort of vague expression of concern. And I'm not exactly sure what to feel during these sequences because I don't know who any of these people are. I don't know their motivations or anything. And then just as soon as it's there, it's gone, roll the OP. Jesus, I hate these things. It's just a bad way to start a show, full stop. Okay, so on to the actual story after the OP is done. Our story focuses on Naofumi, an unassuming, bland as hell 20-something college student. Hey, those aren't my words, those are his. Deadass, this guy introduces himself as a totally uninteresting person and says it in a tone that seems to suggest that he's actually almost proud of this. Well, good for you, dude, but in case you missed it, you're trying to sell me on a show right now and you're failing, miserably. I half expected him to say that his favorite food was plain lukewarm oatmeal and that his favorite color was clear. Wait a minute, bland uninteresting guy talking about how bland and uninteresting his life is? Oh no. No, 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 no. Oh hell no. Are they gonna- Oh, he's into MMORPGs. Called it. This is gonna be an isekai show. I knew it. Like that genre isn't done to death at this point already. Okay, okay, maybe he'll spice it up with something. They do that a lot these days. Isekai show, but it's a parody slash comedy. Isekai show, but it's set in a restaurant. Isekai show, but it's a reverse isekai show. Isekai show, but the pro tag guy has a smartphone with him. Twice. All right, we'll see how this plays out. I'll reserve judgment, or at least try to for now. Although the fact that he's wearing Cosmo's green tracksuit is pretty damn irritating. MC Protag Guy goes to a library to check out some light novels and finds a dusty old one that looks a little out of place. He gives it the once over and, oh Jesus Christ, he's gonna get transported to the fantasy world by a book? Really? Are we gonna be that unoriginal? God, Konosuba's opening sequence was way more riveting than this, and need I remind you that show was a damned comedy. At any rate, Dusky gets transported directly into the court of the king of this country that needs his help fending off some sort of evil existential threat coming from the demon world. Again, is this show even trying to be original? Okay, okay, I'll just keep pushing forward. The only catch is there are three other dudes from different versions of the same modern day Japan. They already know what the deal is because they've played their timeline's equivalent of the game this world is based off of. Downside is, Naofumi never had this game in his timeline and he's a step behind everybody else. We also get a big ol' exposition dump to explain this show's tired and extremely predictable premise. That's boring enough, but buckle up because you're about to get hit with the same realization that I did. It's only gonna get worse. Now we're stuck in one of the worst situations any writing staff can find themselves in. They have to explain everything enough so as to be coherent and without feeling rushed, but the audience has seen this exact same situation played out so many times before that we're several steps ahead and we're just waiting around for the plot and the characters to catch up with us. In a word, we're bored. Turns out that in this game that's super popular in the other three worlds, there are four classes of hero to play as. Sword, Spear, Bow, and and shield. MC Pro Tech Guy winds up with the shield in case the title of the show flew right over your head. However, in this game, no one ever picked the shield hero because he's kind of useless. You only get XP for defeating enemies by landing the final blow. And since the shield hero is purely defensive in nature, that means he can't get any XP so nobody ever picks him. Even the king and his court almost completely ignore Naofumi. Sucks for you, dude. But seriously though, that is really, really shitty game design. You only have four playable characters and one of them is totally busted to the point where you can't even gain XP? How the hell did that even make it out of beta, let alone become the most popular game in Japan in three different timelines? Anyway, Sword, Spear, and Bow dudes are kinda douchebags, not gonna lie. They treat our MC Protag guy like he's some sort of outcast even though he's stuck in the exact same boat they are, being transported to some fantasy world against their will to fight against the demon hordes. They belittle him at just about every turn and laugh at him with everybody else.
else. They're just total assholes and for no reason either. No explanation given. They're just dicks to be dicks because they're the closest thing we have to an antagonist at this point. The first day preparations come about for our heroes and the four of them form parties with the kingdom's best adventurers. The NPCs pick which heroes they want to work with and wouldn't you know it, nobody picks our humble shield hero. Hey, he's just like me. Nobody ever picked me to do anything either, somebody autistically shouts from in front of their computer screen. I'm looking at you. Actually, hold up. Somebody does pick Naofumi, a damsel named... Uh, hell, I can't remember her name. Did they even give her a name? Whatever, this hot piece of tail joins Shield Guy's party, and the two of them go out monster hunting and buying armor and gear. All the while, our female party member never says anything of any importance or has any meaningful conversation with Protag Guy. Uh, yep, she's gonna betray him. Or she's a demon. Or... Or... Maybe she's a demon who will betray him. The possibilities are truly endless. The two get dinner at the end of the day, and now Fumi checks out early in his own room, only to be awakened the next morning to find all his stuff gone and his hot side chick nowhere to be found. Next thing you know, the king's guards are swooping in to arrest Shield Dude for some unnamed charge. He gets thrown in front of the king, and there is Side Chick being awfully cuddly with Spear Guy. So what's all this hullabaloo about? Well, Side Chick over there accuses Naofumi of drinking to excess the night before and barging into her room and having his way with her. Naofumi tries to defend himself but sucks at it, and the king declares that he will only spare his life because he is one of the prophesied heroes. Now an outcast with nothing to his name, Naofumi leaves the court and scours the countryside trying to find the means to survive. Wait a second, hold up. When all these accusations are flying around, did nobody bother to ask the question, well then what happened to all of his stuff? Now Fumi, to his credit, does accuse Miss Dame and Spear Guy of colluding together to take his stuff, but I don't even know how that was possible since the two of them knew each other for exactly 10 seconds longer than she knew Shield Guy, but the court never follows up on it. The guards admit, yeah, now Fumi had nothing on him and his room was empty, but that line of questioning just gets dropped. Come on, people, your justice system can't be this fucked up. Did no one bother to smell Shield Guy's breath to see if it smelled like alcohol? What about his clothes? They should smell like booze, too. Why does Side Chick still have all of her stuff and show no signs of defensive injury? How come no one at the tavern or inn can corroborate this story? There is exactly one witness and that's it. The only evidence she brings against him is a purple nighty she planted on his bed. But even that is in pristine condition, no booze or rips on it or anything. A high schooler could have blown this case wide open. Now Fumi, you're in college, you got no excuse, dude. Go watch some Law and & Order and go read some John Grisham novels. Doctor's orders. So now Fumi roams the countryside, gathering what he can to barter for some gear to get back off the ground floor again. He tries to sell some fragments of monster hides, but the shopkeep tries to rip him off. Done with being taken advantage of, Nafumi uses force and a few captured monsters to threaten the shopkeep into giving him a fair deal. Now, there it is, the twist. MC Protag Guy becomes the monster everybody else made him out to be. Unfortunately, this twist is too little too late to save the show because we're about 35 minutes into our 40 minute run at this point. Talk about a day late and a dollar short. Anyone with even a tertiary understanding of isekai anime would have passed up on this show as soon as we got transported to this fucked up place through a goddamn light novel. The episode ends with Naofumi using his new funds to visit a slaver. I guess if he can't get party members the legit way, he might as well buy them off, right? Although slavery's a bit much, don't you think? I would have stopped at mercenaries, but hey, that's just my moral line in the sand. We get a quick glance at a figure in a cage, and we can just barely tell that this is the girl from the flash forward sequence at the very beginning of the episode. Cut to black, roll the ED. What the? Okay, as soon as this show starts to get the slightest inkling of being something interesting, the episode is over. I hate to say it because I don't like shitting on other people's hard work, but Rising of the Shield Hero is beyond mediocre. It is on some new level of mediocrity previously not thought possible in this time space. If its mediocrity were to ever manifest in physical form, it would surely collapse in upon itself due to its sheer weight, thus creating a black hole that would suck up all light, life, and creativity in its wake. Okay, geez, that did sound a little bit harsh, but this show does itself no favors. It never, at any point, tries to differentiate itself from the pack, and at the end of the day, just seems like a waste of time. If someone does get some sort of enjoyment out of this, they must have never seen an isekai show before. That's the only way I can see this happening. I was just sitting there the entire time waiting for some sort of punchline to drop, and it never did. That being said, Rising of the Shield Hero gets a hard pass from me. Steer well clear of this one, and just twiddle your thumbs this season until the fourth season of My Hero Academia drops. Until next time, take it easy.